question that I have for myself firstly is who am I and why am I here? So every one of us needs to ask ourselves who am I and why am I here? I am a human being. A human is Ashraful Makhluqat, the most noble of the rest of the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in Surah Al-Teen, لَقَدْ خَلَقُنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ We have created mankind in the best of postures. No other creature of Allah has a better posture than ours. The nose, the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the fingers, the nails, the hands, the elbows, the knees. Everything is placed in such a way that none of us, no matter how hard we try, can think up a better place to put those organs. Think about it. Your hair. Where would you like your beard to be? The best place is here. Where would you like your eyes to be? The best place is here. That's Allah's challenge. Allah tells you, I have made it the best, which means, man, you can't play with what I have done. Try. Try to think. You will not be able to come up with something better. Number one. Number two, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Indeed, we have honored human beings. We have honored the children of Adam, which means human, the human beings. So the first human was Adam alayhi salam. Allah created him. The second human was Hawa alayhi salatu was salam. Allah created her in a slightly different way, but she was also created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After that, there was birth, one after the other. Allah showed us that I can create without the involvement of male or female, such as Adam. I can create with the involvement of a male with no female, such as Hawa السلام, or Eve, may peace be upon her. I can create with the involvement of a female, no male, such as Isa السلام, and I can create through male and female, such as you and I. That's the Qudra of Allah. He's shown us all four probabilities, all four possibilities He has shown us. So, when he made us, why did he make us? You have to ask yourself the question, why am I on earth? How come people come here, birth is very hard, gestation, pregnancy is very difficult, why? And how come when I come onto the earth, I can't remember the moment that I came into the earth? I cannot. And I cannot remember the, di the time that I was in the womb of my mother, but I was living. There was life at a certain point, 120 days, the ruh is blown. I can't remember anything. How come? Why? There must be a reason. Also, when I was born, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum la ta'lamuna shay'a. Allah has taken you out of the wombs of your mothers whilst you knew nothing. You didn't know how to talk. You didn't know how to walk. Nobody ever came out of the womb of their mothers and started running or started walking. It never happened. The only child that came out and started speaking was Isa alayhi salam. Allah makes mention of it, but that was miraculous. How come I could not do anything? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept everything for a reason. I want to touch on that. How come... As I grow older, someone needs to look after me. If they did not look after me, I would have died. If nobody took care of a baby that is born, the baby would die. Matter of time. Someone needs to take care of the baby. Why? Also, as you grow older, you start learning a few words. From whom? From your parents. And if they are not there, then from those around you. Why? How come I cannot just choose where I want to be born? How come I cannot choose my parents? How come I cannot choose which nationality I should have been? How come I cannot choose to have been born in Mecca or Medina? How come I cannot choose the color that I wanted to be? The eyes, the nose, the type of hair, etc. Why can I not choose? Why? Question. Also, as I grew older, I had these parents. I didn't choose them. Someone chose them for me. Who was that? Allah. Also, they taught me their dialect. They taught me their language. If I was living in China, it was Chinese. If I'm living in Trinidad, 
You know what you speak, don't you? Subhanallah. It is your accent. I come from Zimbabwe, you can hear my accent. It's a little bit different from yours, but you can understand it. Yours is a little bit difficult to understand. But at the same time, I need to ask myself, why? Then I grow older, now I know how to talk, now I know how to walk, now I can start understanding things, I see everything. What does Allah want from me now? He wants something from me. How do I know He wants something from me? Because I see other people starting to die. That's what I see. There were people my age, they started dying. My friends died. A few people, someone had a health matter, diagnosed cancer, young age, leukemia, whatever it was, they passed away. But that guy went to school with me. Do you get the point? May Allah grant shifa to those who are struggling with any illness. Say Amin. And then I see older people passing away. And then I see healthy people becoming unhealthy. And then I, I am taught that this man who passed away was stronger than you and I. But he passed away. Then I see people fighting for what? For money. How come? Why didn't Allah just give me one checkbook as I was born and say, right, for your life, here it is, take it. Why does Allah want me to work hard in order to eat? Why do I have to eat? Have you thought of it? We have to put something in here a few times a day. We have to drink. Why? Why didn't Allah just make us automatic? You know, hovercraft. I just press a button here and next thing I'm flying, I'm going. Why? Why did Allah do this to us? What's the purpose? How come I have to eat so many times a day? If I eat today, I have to eat tomorrow. And if I eat tomorrow, I have to eat the next day. And in order for me to eat, I need to work. I need to get money. In order to get that money, I have to sweat. Why? People say your sustenance is written. How come it's written? Yes. But at the same time, I need to work for it. I need to make sure I do certain things to get it. Why is it that some things are not allowed? How come? Why? There is a reason for all this. Let me take it a little bit further. When I want to get married, how come I propose someone rejects? Why? They reject. I propose, I'm happy, she's happy. Her father says, no way. Not at all. He doesn't speak your accent. Not at all. Why is it that sometimes, okay, I want to get married, mashallah, things are easy, then I cannot have children. Why? How come I cannot have kids, for example? I'm talking of just an example. And how come some others, they have twins, some people have triplets? Why some mothers-in-law are so kind and others are not? How come? How come? You know, the other day someone sent me a message telling me, do you know father becomes father-in-law? Mother becomes mother-in-law. Son becomes son-in-law. Daughter becomes daughter-in-law. The wife, what does she become? She is the law. That's what it is. So, <laughs> may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. <laughs> How come? Why some people have wives who... Subhanallah are the coolness of their eyes and some people they see them the eyes become red what's the purpose and vice versa as well some people have good husbands and some people the husband is busy drinking he is liming and whatever else how come why why is my test like this some people say, I, I was so pious, I tried my best, I didn't miss a salah, I made dua to Allah, I was this and I was that, but how come I have a spouse who is troubling me? And some other people, they're not pious at all, but they're getting everything. How come? Why? Subhanallah. How come some people die early and other people are sick and they're ill and they're not healthy and they have a life that is full of misery according to them? Why is that the case? I tell you now what the answer is. Allah says it in Surah Al-Mulk. الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور. It is He who created death and life in order to test you. That's all. Everything is a test from the beginning 
to the end is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He chose the playing field and he chose the tests and he put you into that particular test. And he says, I am testing all of you. He knows where we were before we were born and he knows where we are going to go after we will die. And he knows there is a better place that we will be in by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only if we recognize him. This is why Islam is a religion. Today, I saw a news piece on BBC that Islam is the fastest growing religion because there are no risks in Islam when it comes to worship. Who are you worshipping? When you put your head on the ground, what do you say? Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. You are glorifying he who made you. Rabbun. If I say glory be to he who made me, who, he who is in control of my life, he whom I'm going to return to, he who my sustenance is in his hand, etc. Can I be risking anything? No. I put my head on the ground. I say, oh, you who made me, I'm putting my head on the ground. I will never worship anyone besides you. Are you taking a risk? And you are saying you are the highest. Here I am, I've put my head on the lowest possible ground. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. No religion has such a beautiful ibadah known as sujood that we have. The prostration that we have. It is amazing. It is a direct plug in with Allah. أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ لِرَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدٌ The closest that a worshipper can get to his Rabb is when he is in prostration. That's what Allah says. So it's amazing. This is why it's the fastest growing religion. But what about us? I want to give you an example. The example of football. Who wrote the rules of football? You or someone else? Someone else? The fathers of football. What did they say? The match shall be nine minutes. Am I right? See, everyone knows about football. They're quickly saying no. You know the rules. 90 minutes. Now am I right? Yes. Unless it goes into injury time, overtime, etc. We're not going to talk about that. But I want to draw a very interesting parallel. What is your job in 90 minutes? What is the job? When the whistle blows, you dive in, into the pitch. And what's your job? Please, can someone say it? Everyone said score a goal. Right? If you scored one, is the match over? What happens? You've got to keep on scoring as much as you can. And you've got to break history. Even if the other team is so useless, you can score 15-0, 20-0, 50-0, 55-0. You will be in the Guinness Book of Records. Why? You did the best. You guys, you, you went through the, the, the opposition and you scored one after the other. And what is the opposition trying to do? They're trying to get the ball from you and they want to score. Right? If the opposition scores one, listen carefully, wallahi, it's a very interesting example. If the opposition scores one goal and you haven't yet scored and there's 10 minutes in the, meaning 10 minutes remaining, have you lost already? How many of you have seen football matches where last five or 10 minutes or over time and you find everything changes? Am I right? Then what happens? The final whistle is blown. When the final whistle is blown, you can take the ball in front of the goal and you can kick it in as many times as you want. Will it help you? No, it won't. And also, if you are offside, what is offside? It means you are against the rules. You are running, the ball is behind you, and then you suddenly got the ball, you are offside. If you are offside and you score a goal, do they count it? Why? Because it's against the rules. You've broken the rule. It was a goal, but it was wrong because you did not follow the rules. Now I want to go back to what I'm saying. You were born and I was born. Our 90 minutes are from Allah. Some might go injury time. Some might go here, there. Your job is to score as many goals as you can throughout your life. I read my farad. Now I will read my sunnah. Now I will read my nafil. And if shaitan scores one goal, it does not mean you lost the match. You go and score another two, three. Even if the sh shaitan scored 15 goals, you score 16, who won? You won. This is why there is a mizan on the day of judgment. There is a scale. And Allah says, فَمَن فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ وَمَن خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ 
فَأُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Those whose scales are heavier than the bad. The good is more than the bad. 16, 15. Allah says, you are successful. You are successful. You did more good than bad. And those whose scales are lighter, the good deeds are lighter than the bad, you have lost yourself. You have destroyed yourself. You are gone. Finished. You know how it feels when there is, and wallahi, my brothers and sisters, you know the World Cup, we have a lot of lessons from it. A lot. I've spoken about this once before. And I'm speaking about it again today from a different angle. I want to tell you what we have to learn. We have to learn that, subhanallah, no matter what happens during that 90 minutes, okay, your job is one thing. You follow the rule, you don't harm anyone in the process. If you suddenly start punching someone, what happens? You get a red card. You need to do two things here. You, you make sure you score a goal and you make sure you don't break the rules. In Islam, as Muslimin, we make sure that we do as many good deeds as possible. Don't harm anyone. If you harm someone, you get a red card. What does that mean? Your good deeds go to that person. That's what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, teaches us. You're scoring an own goal. You see? You're scoring an own goal. Make sure you don't harm people. Today, there is enough hatred amongst the ummah for petty issues. Make sure you learn to love one another. We are part of one jama'ah. We are part of a group of la ilaha illallah. Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhal al jannah. The Prophet ﷺ made a simple hadith. He says, whoever says la ilaha illallah, believing in it, obviously, they will enter jannatul firdaus. He was asked, wa in zana, wa in saraq. He said, wa in zana, wa in saraq. After the third time, he, that's what he said. He kept on repeating, whoever says la ilaha illallah. Here we're talking about you believe, right? They will enter Jannah. Even if they've made mistakes in the process, they seek forgiveness. Allah will forgive them. Imagine shaitan, such as the opposition, they score a goal. And you say, look, I'm sorry. So the referee says, okay, we'll delete that goal. Can it happen? But Allah does that. Shaitan scored a goal. You say, hey, I'm sorry. That was our fault. The goalkeeper says, hey, I let it go down. And you know what? Allah says, don't worry. We'll delete it. Try again. That's the mercy of Allah. That's why he's called Arhamur Rahimin. My brothers and sisters, don't waste time. Do you see in the football match anyone standing for a little while and they're chit-chatting, they have their WhatsApp and they're on while the match is going on? No, there's no time for that. Your life is short. You don't have time to waste. Two things the Prophet says people are deceived about. Many people are deceived about two things, their health and their spare time. So they waste both of them. While you're healthy, there's no injury. Start running, score a goal, another goal, a third goal. Don't lose hope, no matter what. And you know what? Even if you're losing, if there is that extra time, the overtime, they call it injury time. Matches have changed. I know of a match where it was 1-0. And after a while, it became 2-1 in injury time. Subhanallah. You must be knowing the same match, right? Injury time. So never lose hope. A person who spends his whole life in a bad way, but towards the end he does good. He has succeeded. And a person who spends his whole life in a good way, towards the end he does bad. He has failed. Just like the football. You see the example I'm giving you? Because as we were coming here, I saw Manny Ramjohn Stadium. And I thought to myself, I better talk about this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. It shows us the purpose of our existence. Now, the rules were written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are offside, what happens? You are worshipping, but there is shirk in your worship. It's thrown out, no matter what. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we sent you messengers to tell you our rules. When you are on the pitch, the pitch is this life, okay? When you're on the pitch, there are rules. You cannot do what you want. I cannot pick up the ball. It's a handball, right? There will be a penalty. I cannot just run as I wish. I got to make sure everything is in order. I need to wear a specific uniform. I cannot just pitch up and I'm playing for Germany and I've got the Argentina uniform. 
A Muslim has a dress code. You cannot just dress like anyone and think that, no, that's fine. The females have a uniform. The males have a uniform. Your uniform, when people see you, they need to know you belong to this team. Wallahi, it's a reality. You belong to a powerful team. Subhanallah. I have met people, I don't know what team they belong to, whether they're Argentina or Germany. It's hard to say salamu alaikum to some people because they might say, hello, back to you. And then you feel like you were stumped. But had they had some form of uniform and we said assalamu alaikum and wa alaikum assalam, we smile at each other and we go, we are part of a team. When you are part of a team, that is when you score. If you think you can do it on your own, shaitan will dribble the ball away from you. Remember that. So together we will achieve yadullahi ma'al jama'ah. We need to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us the importance of the group. We need to be together. The disunity that is caused for petties is what is destroying the entire ummah. Shaitan keeps on trying with us every day. What is his job? To make us fail. He wants to score against us every day. So time of Fajr, there is a match going. You are running with the ball. I hope you are anyway. Some of us are sleeping. So you're running with the ball. And what happens? Shaitan is running back with the ball. He takes the ball away from you. You take it back from him. He takes it away from you. Take it back. The ultimate thing is you need to score that goal. Get up for Fajr. Prove it that I'm going to read my Salah. And that's it. When you read it, one goal. What happens? After a little while, you start swearing. You start lying. You, you are on WhatsApp with someone illegitimate. You're not supposed to be with them. What happens? Shaitan scored a goal. Now it's 1-1. Now... Later on, you need to rectify that. We ask Allah's forgiveness. We go. The next thing happens. I must pick up my Quran. It's not easy. I promise you one thing we're all guilty of, myself included. We don't recite enough Quran. I promise you that is something we're all guilty of. Many of us, we might do this, do that. How many of us actually have the Quran with a marker in it at home and we read one page a day and we move the marker? How many of us, I don't even want you to raise your hands because I know the number is very small. Our relationship with the Quran has been bad and it is bad and it can be better. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا the complaint of the Prophet ﷺ, Oh Allah, my qawm, my people have taken this Qur'an. They have abandoned it. They have abandoned its message. Imagine, we are the ummah of Muhammad ﷺ. We don't want to fall under that category. We don't want to fall under the category of people who have abandoned the Qur'an. So I call on myself and yourselves, take one Qur'an in your house Keep a marker, read one page a day, read half a page a day, read one verse a day and move the marker, move the marker, move the marker. Wallahi, a day will come. Either you will complete it and start again or either you pass away and Allah gives you a reward based on the fact that you intended to complete the Quran. Imagine. But remember when shaitan scores that goal against you because you lied, because you swore, because you committed a sin, you need to quickly... Go back, score the goal, because that is life. Your whole life will continue one after the other, after the other. Now, I tell you, people say, but I'm a pious person. How come I got so many problems? Why is my life more difficult? Because if your life is more difficult, your certificate will be higher, your prize will be bigger. Look, when you are playing World Cup, right? How many teams are there at the beginning? I think they want to increase the number of teams now, right? Have you heard that? Everyone's nodding. Mashallah, we know more about the rules of World Cup than we know about our own deen. But anyway, keep on nodding if you do know the answer. That doesn't mean you must uh, pretend like you don't know. Okay. So, we have, say, 48 teams. Maybe they want to increase it a little bit more. Initially, it's the knockout stage, right? So, you have teams. If you're a strong team, you play them and it was a walk in the park. 5-0, you won it, right? You went to the next stage. Will the team be an easier one or a more difficult one? Tell me. More difficult because now you got into the, what do they call them? The, the group stage, right? Now you're in the group stage. Again, the initial games will be a little bit easier. You got into the quarterfinals. Quarterfinals, you're playing England. Subhanallah. What's happening? It's going to be a tough match. There's interest. Everyone is watching. Wallahi, I tell you. 
The angels are watching. They are recording. Those are cheering you on. There is a force, angelic force, telling you to do good. Subhanallah. Do good. And then there is the opposition booing you, telling you to do bad. And shaitan is trying. And the match is now very heavily attended. What's happening? I played England. Imagine I won. <laughs> That's, it's going to be very, very tough. But guess what? I'm into the semis. Mashallah. I'm into the semifinals. And the semifinals is very important. I have to win. So I will train. I will practice. I will get up in the morning. I will run here. I will do that. I will fly to Tobago. And I will make sure that every day I'm swimming back and forth. And I'm doing this. Why? I'm just getting ready for the day that the semifinals happens. How much effort? Subhanallah. Big effort. Because why? It's a very important thing. So as you get closer to Allah, don't think life becomes easier. He promises that it will become more difficult. He promises. But you will have contentment. You'll be a happy person. Look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa How many difficulties did he have? Challenges did he face? Was he ever upset? Was he ever depressed? Never. He was content. You know what he said in Ta'if? He said, oh Allah, if you are happy and pleased with me, I don't mind anything else. I don't mind what's happening. Subhanallah. For as long as you are happy with me. So that's the happiness of Allah. We are striving towards it. We need it to come in our direction. My brothers and sisters, remember, this is very interesting. You suddenly, the semifinals, it's 0-0. Zero, zero, and 90 minutes are up. What happens? You get a chance. You're going to overtime. What happens? You're going to overtime. They give you, I think, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Is that right? Don't pretend like you don't know. Okay, <laughs> and then once you have that and nothing happens, they blow the whistle and we go into penalties. We go into penalties. You better make sure your goalkeeper. Penalties means we are now open that we just want to score this goal. We are not going to run with the ball. We are now standing in front of you. We're going to score. But the penalties are the most decisive when it comes to winning the match. So when it comes to a certain point, it's you and shaitan. That's it. There is adultery to be committed right in front of me. Everything is easy to do. Facilitated. Nobody's going to be watching. What a beautiful person, etc. Everything is easy going. And the shaitan is looking. He wants to shoot that penalty. Subhanallah. And you look. You take three, four steps back. What do you do? Subhanallah. Are you listening? It's a tough one. There is adrenaline. Everyone is watching. Boom, boom, boom. And you take two, three steps and you go for it. And guess what happens? The goalkeeper dives in the wrong direction. Make sure at that point, your ball does not go beyond the bar. <laughs> Subhanallah. Make sure at that point, it goes where it is supposed to go. You know what to do. You know the rules. You know that if it is haram, the pleasure is going to be temporary. It's going to be fake. And it's going to bring a lot of regret. So you don't want to do that. What do you do? You rush towards the right thing. And you make sure you've scored the goal when it was the most difficult. We didn't do anything for so long and now suddenly we did the right thing. My brothers and sisters, you suddenly win the match and thereafter your day comes. Your day comes when you have that World Cup and everyone is holding it and everyone is excited. It is very sad that I have to give this example. But to be honest with you, we enjoy that match. We know how it works we have a more important match known as your real life. Each one of us comes in when the whistle is blown, metaphorically. Each one of us has to rush in a certain direction. Each one of us is on our own, but we keep passing the ball where we are told to pass the ball. We help each other in our lives. If you, I want to ask you a question. If you pass the ball and you set the goal and someone else scored the goal, who wins? The whole team won. Do you get it? The whole team won. Same applies in the dunya. When you help someone to do good, Allah says, I'll give you the full reward of it as well because you helped. 
That's why. When you did not help, you are selfish. So it's amazing how the similarities are. But we understand it for one thing, that is leisure and pleasure. But we don't understand it for another thing that is absolutely serious. Absolutely serious. And I tell you, every point that we learn of the, that match applies in our lives in a different way. Like I said, some people live a little bit longer. Maybe Allah wants them to score some more. Maybe it's not yet time. You know, subhanAllah, Allah knows best. When your time is, your whistle shall be blown. You need to make sure you get that cup. You need to make sure you get the prize. You need to make sure you played. Don't lose hope until the end. Imagine your enemy scores one, two, three. You're sitting three nil. You can make it four three by the will of Allah. You can. I promise you, you can. Or take it to three three and then it gets to overtime and penalty and then you can win. You can. You can. But try not to let it get to that boiling point because you know the penalties. Even the good team can lose, right? Because now it's too close. And it's tricky. So try to score it before. My brothers and sisters, that is life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِن قَبْلِكَ مِن رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدُونَ O oh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa we have never sent a messenger before you except that we have taught every one of them to convey the message that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. So worship me alone. Allah is saying, every messenger from the beginning to the end came with one message. Worship Allah alone. Don't worship shaitan. Make sure my brothers and sisters that we fulfill this in a way that we follow the rules set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make sure, like I was saying, Allah chose the ground. Allah chose where you're going to be born because it's a test. If it wasn't a test, He would have allowed you to choose. Allah chose what problems you're going to have because it's a test. If it wasn't a test, He would tell you, you choose what you want. Allah chose your eyes, your lineage, your color, your complexion, your nationality, whatever else Allah chose. And as time passes, He's just watching you to see even when you have wealth and power and position, Allah in the Quran uses the same word, liyabluwakum. Huwa alladhi ja'alakum khala'ifa fil ard. Allah is the one who, keep, who has made you on earth one after the other. And in another place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَفَعَ بَعْضَكُمْ فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ دَرَجَاتٍ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ فِي مَا آتَاكُمْ Allah has raised some of you above others. Allah has raised some of you above others in different matters of this world in order to test you regarding what He has given you. If Allah gave you, He's testing you. If Allah took it away from you, He's testing you. How do you react? Don't be upset. This life is temporary. Life is temporary. So when you get close to Allah, Allah will give you contentment. Some people, they have a thorn on their toe and they are so suicidal. Another person's leg was amputated and they are saying, Alhamdulillah, at least I'm still alive. Why? It's Iman. It's your yaqeen, your conviction in Allah. You believe He knows what He's doing. You believe He is Rabbul Izzati Wal Jalal. He is my maker. I'm going to go back to Him. This world was not made in order for us to do as we please. There, there is another place to do that, known as Jannah. If we could do whatever we pleased in this world, what was the purpose of creating Jannah to Firdaus? There was no purpose. Because someone would say, if you were asked, do you want to go to a place where you do what you want? You say, I'm already in a place where I do what I want. What was the point? Allah says, no, in this world, you don't do what you want. You've got to follow the rules, do what we want. And Allah will give you. Be happy with your fair share of challenges and tests. Maybe sickness, maybe you, lo you lost your job, you're looking for a job, you want a child, you have a marital problem. How are you going to solve it? Watch your tongue. Every time you swear, you've lost. Every time this happens, you lose, and so on. Remember, my brothers and sisters, 
we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us ease. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors. I want to end off by making mention of the most serious goals that are scored by the devil. Number one, I said it already. He makes us associate partners with Allah in any way and in every way. He is trying. So even if you are reading salah, you want to beautify it because people are watching. That's wrong. You lose the reward. Sometimes we do things besides Allah. We are worshipping trees and sticks and stones and saints, etc., etc. When Allah says, I've sent all the messengers, in the Quran, Allah says it in more than one place. I've sent all the messengers in order to remind you to worship me alone. La ilaha illa ana fa'buduni. All these messengers that came from the beginning to the end, all of them, I gave them one message to give you, and that was, there is none worthy of worship besides me, so worship me alone. Be careful because shaitan's plan, when that goal is scored against us, it is more dangerous than any other goal you can ever have. Secondly, sometimes what we do is, we break the rules. We are offside. How? We fulfill a deed. It may be a good deed. But we added something extra or we subtracted something. So we are not following the rules of the game. Who decided the rules of the game? Allah. And who brought those rules? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa How you should read salah, what time you should read salah, how, what should happen is all decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I hope and I pray we can protect ourselves from that which is innovation in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because in that way we will be able to score the maximum number of goals. I hope you've understood the examples I've delivered. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from me and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant me steadfastness and all of us, may Allah grant us death as muwahideen and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a death as muttabi'een those who follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannatul Firdaus with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa